Welcome to Indian Arthroscopy Society webinar today evening. Uh, we have a guest who does not need an introduction, Dr. William Ben Kibler. Dr. Ben Kibler has got extensive experience and he's got a treatise in scapular dyskinesia. And uh, this is what we are going to hear it from him. Dr. Kibler is from uh, Shoulder Center of Kentucky from Lexington Clinic, uh, Kentucky, US. Uh, Dr. Shriash will uh, briefly introduce our speaker today and uh, followed by uh, the presentation by uh, Dr. Ben Kibler himself. Uh, Dr. Shriash, please. Shriash, you have to unmute. Shriash, please. Uh, yes, done. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you, IPS Oberoi. And uh, uh, it's a great uh, privilege and honor to have uh, Dr. William Benjamin Kibler uh, to talk on uh, scapular dyskinesia. Where are we today? So optimal scapular function is integral to optimal shoulder function. Scapular <coughs> dysfunction continues to be associated with various shoulder pathologies. And scapular dyskinesia is a relatively new concept in the assessment of shoulder pathology. And to give us an update on this topic, we have a world-renowned expert, Dr. William Ben Kibler from uh, Lexington Clinic, Kentucky, USA. He has a special interest in shoulder surgery, scapula, acute knee injury surgery, sports medicine, and arthroscopic surgeries of the knee, ankle, and elbow. He graduated from Vanderbilt Medical School, Nashville, Tennessee, and completed his residency in orthopedic surgery and subsequently a neuromuscular diseases fellowship in Vanderbilt University. He joined Lexington Clinic in Kentucky in 1977 and established the Shoulder Center of Kentucky and has been at the forefront of comprehensive shoulder repair and rehabilitation and has had a profound impact in the field of sports medicine. As an internationally recognized and renowned visionary in this field, he has shared his expertise through speaking engagements and educational symposiums, both domestically and abroad. He's held many important posts over the years with various organizations, such as the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine, the American College of Sports Medicine, the Society for Tennis Medicine and Science, and the ISACOS, to name a few. He has also contributed to many professional publications and has been honored with numerous awards, including the coveted Thomas Brady Award by the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine, which recognized him for his service and dedication to sports medicine and the impact he has made on his community. Some of his other achievements include developing the first comprehensive sports medicine program in Kentucky, being the first to provide athletic training services to area schools and sports organizations in Kentucky, developing three consensus conferences on disorders of the scapula, performing over 23,000 surgical procedures, being a founding member for the Society for Tennis Medicine and Science, also being a head team physician for the Lexington legend since 2001. Within the realms of medical innovations, he was the first to describe kinetic chain in sports activities and scapular kinematics and scapular dyskinesis. He wrote and co-edited first and only book on scapular disorders, developed concepts of core stability and closed chain rehabilitation, developed protocols and programs that set the basis for comprehensive shoulder rehab, developed and described three clinical tests for shoulder pathology, developed and determined outcomes for two operations for AC injury and scapular muscle development, developed the personal insight program to address issues of professional and personal burnout. In January this year, he retired from the Lexington Clinic Orthopedic Sports Medicine after 43 years of dedicated service. But as we just heard him uh, offline, that he still continues to engage uh, in a certain amount in clinical activities and in academics. So really, the Indian Arthroscopy Society is really honored and privileged to have an expert like yourself. And I would welcome you and invite you to please give your talk on scapular dyskinesis. Where are we today? Please share your screen. Thank you. Yes, Ben Killiam, um, we, are, we are really, really honored for, uh, as the secretary of the Indian Arthroscopy Society. It's a real honor and privilege to listen to you. Whenever we read scapular dyskinesia, we read your all classification system and how the scapula should be uh, the exercise protocol. So I, in the offline, we have already been discussed how to go ahead. It's a real privilege and you know that the, your lecture will be archived in our society web channel. So please go ahead, sir. Well, thank you very much for um, having me 
uh, come. Thank you for inviting me. I look forward to this discussion and I hope very definitely to <clears throat> interact and be able to do some discussion <clears throat> on this topic. <clears throat> Excuse me. This, uh, our topic is scapular dyskinesis. Where are we today? I want to talk a little bit about what the scapula does in function, what it does in dysfunction, and then how do we evaluate this and treat this problem? Because it's a very common problem. I once again come from the Lexington Clinic in Lexington, Kentucky, and uh, am welcome to be here. First of all, let's talk about what it is. Kinesis or normal motion of the scapula is what we wanna see. Dyskinesis is alteration of that motion. <clears throat> it is either altered resting position, altered motion, and basically what it does, it impairs the normal ability of the arm to do the functional ta tasks. It may be part of the problem, either as a cause or an effect, but it is there, and therefore you need to be able to evaluate and treat this as part of the general uh, treatment for this problem. <clears throat> so I'd like to show you. Here's an example of a patient. And I think you can see that on the left side, there is a normal resting posture of the scapula with the medial border that's uh, well aligned. And then you see the alteration of that normal. You see the prominence of this inferior medial border. And you see you, that the shoulder is drooping to the side. This is something you can observe on the exam. In general, the scapula is in a position of retraction on the normal side and a position of protraction on the uh, injured side. So here's the video, here's what you see. The, the exam is uh, observational. You have the patient move their arms overhead out in front of them three times. And you watch them as it comes back down and you can see the obvious alteration in the symmetry of the motion. This is scapular dyskinesis. That's just what it is. Now, in, in our lab, we can show this. This is uh, an example of a normal scapular function with arm elevation. This runs three times. Each of the axes represents one particular motion of the scapula. Red is upward downward rotation. Green is anterior posterior tilt. And blue is internal external rotation. This video runs four times, so you can watch each of the arms as uh, this moves. So on the first one here, watch the red. You can see that it goes up, that's upward rotation. On the second one, watch the green. You can see that it posteriorly tilts. And then watch the blue, and you see that it goes into external rotation as the arm goes into the overhead position. Now this is an example of an abnormal scapular pad. This is dyskinesis now. And you can see we're looking from behind. This is the left side and the right side. And you see it at difference in the symmetry of the position of the scapula. You see how the right scapula has a protracted position and the left one has a retracted position. You can see the compensations of the trunk to try to get the arm overhead. The whole trunk is moving as part of this loss of ability to move uh, into the overhead position. Now, as you can also see it from this position here, this is looking at from the top. Again, there's your injured side. You see that the scapula does not posteriorly tilt as much as the other side. This is a patient with impingement, and you can see why the impingement will occur. The acromion is not moving sufficiently out of the way to allow the arm to go overhead. This is scapular dyskinesis, alteration of motion. It has multiple clinical effects as a result of that motion. Remember this motion is only, it's not a diagnosis and it's not necessarily always associated with one particular problem. It's just an impairment of the normal motion. If this is the normal motion, this right here is the abnormal motion, alteration. Now there's the, the alteration of scapular rolls that occurs from this. It's normally a link in the kinetic chain from the foot to the hand to allow force development. It's a stable base to allow the muscles uh, that attach to the scapula to move the arm and do the proper things with the arm. 
It uh, allows the glenoid to be a dynamic socket for the ball and socket as the arm moves and does activities, throwing the cricket ball, for example. And then uh, it, the uh, chromium gets out of the way so that the arm can go into this overhead position so you can do that motion in the throwing motion. Remember, this is an impairment of the roles and is only significant if other factors exist, other injuries, other anatomic problems, other mechanical issues, some muscle weaknesses, uh, or a compensation from an injury. So you may see it, but it may not have a role in your evaluation unless it's associated with these other problems. And I'll show you some of these examples. Now, there are lots of reasons that dyskinesis can occur. Most commonly, we always think about the neuropathy. You think about the long thoracic nerve, the spinal accessory nerve giving the problems, but that's actually a very small part of this problem. You can get joint problems. You get AC joint arthritis and separations. I'll show you some examples of that. You can have some uh, internal derangements. You can have labral injury, biceps injury, uh, arthritis, rotator cuff problems. You can have alterations in the bone. This clavicle is a strut to hold the scapula in the right position. It may not work right, and therefore uh, it can give you dyskinesis. But mainly, about two thirds of the time, it's because of soft tissue problems, alterations in muscle strength, muscle flexibility, muscle activation, and these can be uh, addressed very nicely in physiotherapy. Here's an example of the, the, I'll show you in the next two slides all of the causative factors. These are what we would consider to be the non operative reasons that dyskinesis can occur. You can have tightness of the pectoralis minor. You can have alteration of glenohumeral internal external rotation. You can have latissimus dorsi tightness, which actually tends to pull the scapula into protraction as it pulls the arm down. Serratus anterior weakness and inhibition is a very common problem and is associated with this prominence of the inferior medial border. Core weakness, 50% of the patients with scapular dyskinesis have weakness of their core muscles. You can have weakness of the lower trapezius. It gets inhibited fairly easily as well. And then you can have upper trapezius tightness. These can all be evaluated and examined uh, in your clinical exam. There are operative reasons. We're, oper we're orthopedic surgeons. We like to operate on things. Uh, Pectoral malus minus sometimes uh, tightness gets so bad that you have to release it. Commonly, fractured clavicles or AC joint injuries require stabilization to allow the normal scapular position in motion. Glenohumeral arthritis can certainly cause uh, alterations of the muscle activation. Any type of internal derangement, labral injury, rotator cuff, biceps can give feedback to create the muscle problems. Snapping scapula is a well-known problem that sometimes needs surgical procedure. Scapular muscle detachment, which is a post-traumatic tear of the muscle sometimes uh, is, uh, needs to be uh, taken care of surgically. And then of course the nerve issues, either the cervical disc or the long thoracic or accessory nerve injuries. So that's the whole universe of causative factors. Well, how can we break this down? Here is an algorithm that uh, we've developed to look at patients with scapular dyskinesis as part of a clinical problem of their shoulder. It starts off, well, obviously, with some type of shoulder pain and dysfunction. The first uh, task is to identify the presence or absence of scapular dyskinesis. This requires an observational evaluation that I'll show that I've already shown you in the one video. Then you do what's called corrective maneuvers to see if those, the dyskinesis is associated with any of the clinical findings. If it is, then you evaluate for the causative factors. And we'll, we'll go through each of these steps right here. Once you find out these causative factors, hip and core weakness, shoulder muscle weakness, muscle tightness, loss of control of the muscle, detachments, clavicle fractures, uh, AC joint, SC joint problems, glenohumeral hemorrhoid joint pathology, or any neurological, then you've got the entire, uh, you've checked all the boxes. You can do this in a logical progression. This is very easy. It takes literally five to 10 minutes to do, where you have them do hip and core evaluation. You look for scapular muscle detachment. I'm gonna show you all these. You look, you test for the clinical muscle weakness. You look for tightness of the muscles. You look for this, what's called clinical uh, loss of conscious control. And then you can see this. And then you do your joint exam, which you normally would do. You do your fracture exam, which you normally would do. And then you do your neurologic exam. Then you have in order a way of evaluating this. Now, the interesting thing is, as you do this, you can actually show these findings to the patient. And this allows them to also understand 
uh, how the scapula, this thing that they cannot see, is causing some of their problems. So here's, a, here's what we call the scapular assistance test. These are two corrective maneuvers that can change the symptoms and give the, both the clinician and the patient an idea that something is going on with the scapula. Scapular assistance test, you assist the scapular upward motion. This is a patient who has pain and soreness with any attempts at forward elevation. You take the scapula and you assist that scapular upward rotation posterior tilt. And you notice, first of all, they can go farther into motion and they have decrease of their pain. That indicates relief of their impingement findings and suggests that the scapula has a problem uh, as part of the clinical situation. It's a very good test. It's very easy to do. And when they see that it feels better, they really understand why uh, you did this to them. The second test is called the scapular retraction test. This is where you manually stabilize the scapula in retraction. This increases the muscle strength, decreases the findings in, of the internal derangement of the labral injury or the rotator cuff injury. The way you do this is you have them, you test them then in the normal way you test for rotator cuff weakness. They'll have pain and weakness in this area. You manually stabilize the scapula. You see how your forearm fits very nicely on the medial board of scapula. scapula. You test again, and they have normal strength. I was going to show this to you. So you test them. They have symptoms. You then manually position the scapula. You test them, and they improve their strength and reduce their symptoms. Once again, it's a very good test to show them the importance of the scapula. So we're gonna show some cases, we'll go through this and I think this will be a little bit more clear as we go through these cases uh, that illustrate. So the very first case is uh, this 28 year old physiotherapy student. He was taking a class on how to examine the shoulder and he was shown to have this dyskinesis in his shoulder. You can see obviously that there's an asymmetry, the medial border is prominent on this side compared to this side. And he starts getting worried. He says, oh no, I've got a problem. The very first question you need to ask the patient is, do you have any symptoms? This guy didn't have any symptoms. So this dyskinesis by itself, that's just a normal finding. He has no problems with his scapula or his arm. Therefore, he doesn't need to, uh, <laughs> to have any therapy done. However, if this is in association with pain or weakness or problems in the shoulder, then this becomes clinically significant. So let's talk about some of the more common reasons for the causation uh, being a soft tissue problem and how you evaluate this. So here's a patient, works uh, in a repetitive overhead job in a auto plant, and she has impingement findings that if you do these two tests, the uh, scapular attraction test, scapular assistance test, it's positive, they get relief, she gets relief of her symptoms. She has pain over the front of her shoulder, right in the impingement area, and she has pain all along the medial border of the scapula. You say, well, this has got to be a winged scapula. That's got to be some kind of a nerve problem. Her nerve, EMG, and her MRIs are all entirely normal. This is not a structural or anatomic problem. It is a soft tissue causation problem. Now, the, in this situation, the most common things you'd think about is tightness of your pectoralis minor, tendon to pull it forward, weakness of your, of your lower trapezius and your serratus anterior, and tightness and spasm. You see how this upper trap is very tight. So these would be things that you can find. I'll show you an exam in just a minute. Here's a second patient with the same problem. He's a worker. He also plays uh, American baseball, and he cannot throw because he has pain in forward flexion and overhead throwing. He has impingement, and um, he was told that he needed to have a subacromial decompression, which is a very good operation for the right reason. However, in this situation, uh, it turns out to not be the best option. He has uh, his pain in his upper trapezius and in these posterior shoulder muscles. He's got this obvious asymmetry. He has on MRI negative findings for rotator cuff tear or for any type of labral pathology. He has normal neurologic exam. He, when he tries to demonstrate core stability, he is weak. So he has multiple problems of his muscles. He has weakness of his core. He has alteration of the um, 
pectoralis minor. He has tightness of his rotation of his glenohumeral joint because of his throwing, and he has weakness of all his muscles. He needs a comprehensive rehabilitation exam before ever thinking about wanting to do anything into his, his subacromial space. So those are, the, those are some of the things that you can do to take care of the problem. Now, for example, we find that in these soft tissue causation problems, muscle tightness of his pectoralis minor, latissimus, and upper trapezius, either isolated or combined, is 57% of the time. So this grouping of, of uh, findings are very, very common. And if you're not seeing them, they are seeing you uh, when the patient comes to your office. Muscle weakness and inhibition, the serratus gets very weak very early in this problem, and you have to really get the serratus under control to allow the shoulder blade to function normally. And don't forget that uh, the body is connected from the foot to the hand, and that shoulder problems can have, in this situation, 51% of the time, hip and core weakness issues. So here's a way, to, some ways to evaluate this. This is a test we use called low row. It's a combined scapular attraction and hip uh, extension exercise to test the ability of the scapula to retract dynamically. So you do hip extension, trunk extension, and then you, you push a force against their arm and see how they do this. So here's the exam. You can see that as you push against them, they are weak she cannot, she cannot hold the scapula against resistance. Now, if you tighten up the hip muscles, tighten up the hip muscles real good, then you normal, she, ha normal, she has normal strength. So activation of the hip improves scapular attraction ability, which improves shoulder function. This is a good way to examine this and show this for the patient. Now, here's the, 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 the uh, screening evaluation for core stability can be done with what we call a one leg stability series. This is where you have the patient stand on one leg, watch the hip and core stability, then have them do a squat, a half squat, and you can watch and see this evaluation. So you observe cycles of this flexion uh, and uh, bending motion, and you look for the observation. So you see when they stand, they have a little problem with the Trendelenburg. They have a weakness. They cannot stabilize off of their hip. This is, a, this is a good screening test. And then you do the one leg squat. And you see they go down. First of all, the knee goes into uh, var, var, valgus there. And she, she really has a hard time controlling her hip and trunk as she goes through this motion, which you, know, you can imagine that she tries to do that and tries to uh, work with her shoulder, how nothing works all the way through there. So it was again a very good screening exam, which shows you and the patient that they don't have normal hip and core, let alone shoulder function. You can do this very easily uh, in, in their evaluation. You then evaluate for uh, some tightness of the pectoralis minor as well. And this, uh, this occurs over half the cases. So, the, so that's the soft tissue component. Now I wanna talk about when the tissues are actually injured. It can be rotator cuff injury, it can be labral injury in the joint, it could be biceps problems, rotator cuff problems. Uh, this is basically, pain-based inhibition of the muscles, and you have to treat the cause of the pain, which is this injury, as well as rehabilitate the muscles. So here's another case, case two. This is a little bit older now worker. He has a one-year history of impingement with arm weakness. He does this repetitive um, arm activity out through here. He has difficulty doing his repetitive work. He has soreness at nighttime. He has a relief by subacromial injection, but therapy, it does not help him. So his MRI shows a partial rotator cuff injury. I mean, you, you all are understanding, you're getting this history. This guy's got a partial rotator cuff injury and a repetitive job. And he is sent to me for subacromial decompression or possible rotator cuff surgery. So let's look at him and see what the problem is here. He has pain over the front of the shoulder, right in the anterior area where you ought to expect it with impingement. He has soreness with forward flexion. He has impingement. He has some demonstrated, uh, uh, he has good motion with his arm down the side without any trouble. It's only when he gets up into forward flexion. He has weakness of resisted forward flexion with pain, indicating some degree of rotator cuff compromise. Well, let's look at him from behind. First thing you notice, he has an asymmetry of position. This is a little bit more prominent on the left scapula. 
he has pain along through here. As he comes up, you can see as he brings his arm back down, you see the asymmetry of the scapula. It's upward and its medial border is prominent, showing the dyskinesis. Imagine this anteriorly tilted. You come up to the side, upper trap, see the difference in upper trap tightness compared to the right side. So he's got all these findings that the scapula is not moving in the right direction, causing this impingement, causing this finding. So we do these assistance tests, scapular assistance tests. You place the arm, put your hand in this position. You just assist the medial border of the scapula going overhead. You find that he has full range of motion and complete relief of all his impingement symptoms. Once again, showing the acromial component of this impingement. Now, if you stabilize the scapula in retraction, you once again test him in uh, resisted forward flexion. He has normal strength with relief of his symptoms. Therefore, the first uh, treatment on this is not a subacromial decompression. He will not do well with that if he has all these other problems. You have to strengthen his muscles, get his scapula in position. This guy did not ever require surgery. He was able to do these exercises, return to his work activities with a continued exercise program. So he did not need the, even though he demonstrated on the MRI some tear, some partial tear of the rotator cuff, he didn't need surgery. We know from a lot of uh, work showing that impingement is very common in patients with scapular dyskinesis because you have decreased ability to posteriorly tilt. This classical studies, these studies have shown that even though the symptoms and the site of the soreness is anterior chromium, the problem is the anterior tilt putting the acromion in a position of impingement. Therefore, you treat this first. We also know that you cannot elevate the arm if you've got a scapula protracted. You all can do this on your own. You can sit in the normal position, raise your arm overhead, see how far your arm can go overhead. Slump, like most of us do, see how far you can raise the arm. Not nearly as far. Therefore, a protracted scapula gives you problems with full arm flexion. Another case is a, in American baseball, a thrower who has pain and soreness in the shoulder. He has weakness of abduction, external rotation in the cocking position. He has weakness in rotator cuff testing. Uh, he has internal rotation tightness, so he cannot do uh, internal rotation to the same degree. You see the obvious asymmetry between the scapula on the left side and right side is the scapular protraction. He did have a labral injury. He did need surgery, but we had to get his scapula under control before you could do his surgery and to get the best result. We did a study in 2009, which showed that half of the patients with demonstrated labral pathology on exam do not need surgery if you get the scapula into the right position. The other half did, and you had to operate on them. So once again, even if you have true tears, you need to take care of this uh, with a therapy program. The reason for that is uh, this has been shown that in the model, uh, a model of uh, the shoulder, uh, that five degrees of anterior shoulder tilt increases the pressure on the rotator cuff and the labrum five to six hundred percent, a very high percentage. So therefore, you really need to um, consider this. Uh, with rotator cuff disease, uh, very good studies with complete rotator cuff tears show that scapular dyskinesis is present in all, virtually all the patients, and two-thirds of the patients with uh, chronic rotator cuff tears will symptomatically reduce their symptoms by, by getting scapula under control. So this internal impingement, what, in what causes internal impingement? Upward decreased upper rotation or increased internal rotation increases the area or the pressure up under the edge, as I mentioned. So once again, this is a mechanical problem causing shoulder symptoms that can be resolved by addressing the scapula. Well, let's look at bone and joint problems. The strut, the clavicle is a strut. It holds the scapula back in the right position. If it's damaged, you can get scapular protraction, and this may be uh, one of the surgical indications for treating uh, clavicle fractures. Also, AC joint problems. Uh, sometimes you wonder who should be operated on, who should not. Uh, this finding of scapular dyskinesis in this clinical picture can give you some good ideas about helpful indications for surgery. This is an example of a patient who's in my office. You see the obvious malunion of the clavicle, and you see the shortening, and you see the drooping of the scapula. Of the, of the whole shoulder. If you look from behind, once again, you see this protraction of the scapula. Why is this patient in my office? Does his 
non-union male union hurt no it doesn't hurt at all he's in the office because he can't raise his arm in the overhead position well he can't do normal activities in the overhead position this is a problem you get this shortening this male union problem and you see that they have decreased uh motion now obviously you can operate on this patient or um uh, this patient right here, but you know how much more difficult it is to operate on a malunion than it is in the acute situation. So with this in the mind, let's talk about this case. This is a 50 year old uh, uh, bicyclist who does a lot of bicycling. He's very, very uh, into bicycling. He two weeks ago fell and sustained this mid shaft fracture of the clavicle. He was told by another doctor that he did not need any treatment other than a sling because he said that the, everything is lined up well. Well, it's really not lined up well. And the question is, what is the problem? He notices that, that two to three weeks after surgery, after his injury, he can't use his arm the way he wants to. Well, let's look at the, you know, the x-ray says one thing. How about actually looking at the patient? So here's the patient. He's three weeks post-injury. At this point in time, manipulation of his clavicle fracture callus is not particularly painful. He doesn't really hurt at the fracture, but you can see the obvious drooping of his whole arm and he has impingement. He cannot raise his arm any higher than this. He has pain here rather than here. Turn him around and see why. See his obvious, uh, obvious scapular asymmetry, scapular protraction, prominence of the medial border of the scapula. You can actually reduce this fracture. And how you do that is by taking the distal fragment and the scapula, putting it back into the right position, doing the scapular attraction test. And now he can move his arm and says it doesn't hurt anymore. So once again, I say, well, this is what we can expect. If we fix this surgically, then we can have a better chance of you moving your arm properly. And in, indeed, see right now, that's all he can do with the scapula and the protraction. This is a surgical in our mind, an indication for surgical treatment early rather than late. You can give them <clears throat> two to three weeks like this, and if they're not any better at three weeks, then it's still a good time to do the surgical procedure. Here's another case. This is a American football a soccer player. He fell three weeks ago, and you see the obvious problem at his AC joint. Now, how do you classify that? This is a class two, three, five, you know, what is it? How does that help you? with your treatment. This guy says, I still hurt, I still can't run. And, you know, and soccer is a running sport, but he can't run because his shoulder hurts. And why does my shoulder look this way? Well, let's see on the exam, can we do something about that? So if you put the scapula back where it's supposed to be, you reduce that completely. So it goes from a, whatever a three or a five, whatever it is, to a zero. And that tells you that probably you're going to need to be surgically, uh, I'm going to have to treat this surgically to get that result because that will not heal uh, uh, satisfactorily. So the presence or absence of scapulodiskinesis can help you determine uh, the need for surgery. About two thirds of the patients with AC joint disruptions, as you saw, uh, require uh, some idea of surgical treatment. Now, you also can have this situation. This is another patient who has an AC separation. He's three weeks down the road. He fell. He has this obvious <clears throat> asymmetry at the AC joint, but look at his scapula. His scapula is entirely normal. What he has, he basically has the coenoid ligament that's still intact, but he has normal mechanics of the scapula. The reason he's here at three weeks is not, not because he can't do things. He wants to return to work. He, he has no impingement, and so we put him on a therapy program and allowed him to work. Now, it's very interesting that 11 years later, he came back to see me because he has a trouble with his right or left shoulder. But so we got a chance to look at him 11 years afterwards. He still has the asymmetry uh, of the this right here. But he has entirely, he still has normal sc scapular positioning. So he has no, he has no problem uh, with that. So he's done well. So the Presence or absence of dyskinesis can help you decide about treatment. Well, let's talk about arthritis. Glenn humor arthritis, very common problem. Uh, you obviously are going to get some stiffness and tightness with the uh, arthritis. This can affect scapular position and motion and scapular muscle activation. Those don't automatically get better after you do the surgery to take care of the arthritis. 
here's a patient. This is uh, uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Brent Morris, showed me this case. He is now eight months post total shoulder replacement. He is painful and weak. He was sent to Dr. Morris to see about, does he need to have a revision of his total shoulder replacement because he can't move his arm. So if you look, once again, he has relatively normal position, but as he raises his arm, he can only go into forward flexion up to about 90 degrees, and he has pain in the shoulder joint. Is that pain coming from the arthritis, from the shoulder, from whatever? He cannot move his arm. So now my colleague will go up and do a scapular assist test. Showing his muscles aren't, aren't moving a scapula like they ought to, and he has normal motion. There's nothing wrong with his shoulder replacement. It, it's everything to do with the fact that the muscles aren't moving the shoulder and the scapula into the right position. So once again, this guy needs his therapy. He does not need um, another surgery at this time. And then finally, we get to the nerve and muscle uh, injury causation. Once again, the long thoracic nerve, dorsal scapular nerve, you want to have a specific exam on this and EMG findings. Then I want to show you a case of a post-traumatic muscle injury uh, to the low trap and rhomboids that uh, occasionally will be seen as well. So this is a patient, 25-year-old worker, repetitive lifting job, acute pain six months ago. He has weakness. He cannot move his arm. He has had no benefit by therapy. His EMG shows a serratus anterior palsy. And this is what you'll see. This is a classical finding of serratus anterior palsy, prominence of the medial border of the scapula, normal rhomboids. The key point on here is he cannot raise his arm above 90 degrees. That is a hallmark of serratus anterior palsy because if you, if you don't have your serratus anterior, your scapula never will work to allow you to go into over position. So that's a, a, a situation right here. Now, this is another case, and that would require surgical treatment uh, with your transfers. This is a case of a 21-year-old three years after a motor vehicle accident with a traumatic protraction injury. She's had pain and soreness since that time. She cannot go over 90 degrees, but in this situation, her EMG is normal, MRI is negative, and uh, so here's her problem. This is very painful, by the way. You can see the there's muscle bulk on the side. There's actually muscle weakness and atrophy on the side. You once again see that pattern, but you notice she can go over 90 degrees. So this is not a serratus anterior problem. Once again, you can stabilize the arm. You do this, she has pain, and you have the difference in the muscle bulk on this side compared to this side. She has localized pain right along the medial scapular border, right in this area through there. You can do the scapular assistance test and scapular attraction test and improve her function. Once again, she can move it normally, indicating the role of the scapula in the creation of the symptoms. She, she has pain along right along the uh, rhomboid and uh, yeah, everything. This is actually a traumatic injury to the rhomboids and the, and the lower trap. Once again, a, you can do the, low, the scapular retraction test, and it's entirely normal. She has no problems with the, uh, uh, she improves her strength. Therefore, this is this is this clinical diagnosis of scapular muscle injury. Uh, this is, um, I'll show you very briefly, this is a uh, patient, uh, not the same patient, the right shoulder, the head is to the right and the uh, uh, trunk is to the left. The incision, there's a scapular uh, spine, incisions along the medial scapular border. And what you'll do is, is you make this longitudinal incision to, to uh, find the uh, lower trapezius and the rhomboids. And the, uh, this is a relatively, I'll, I'll just show you a few parts of this, and then we'll go to the discussion after this. But basically it's uh, it, not a lot of papers, not a lot of surgeons have been back here. It's a, kind of a uh, different area. It's not the hard, it's not hard anatomy, it's just being, there. so this is your uh, lower trapezius right here. You're freeing the lower trapezius off of the spine coming down through there, and you'll see that there's all this scar tissue where the rhomboid normally attaches. All this is scar tissue. This is lower trapezius over here. This is the medial border of the scapula right here. This is scar tissue uh, where the uh, rhomboids are not attached. And you actually, so now I've got the medial border uh, L, uh, freed up. I've got the infraspinatus actually moved back. There's you actually make pairs of drill holes in the bone and you're going to reattach this 
through drill holes. And I'll show you this. So this is the detachment in the same patient. This is medial border. This is the rhomboid. This is the low trap. This is the area of detachment. And you free this up. You take the infraspinatus down off the medial border of the scapula. You make pairs of drill holes into the bone. You use mattress sutures. There's making your holes in the bone. You make mattress sutures to put the rhomboids and the low trap back to the medial border of the scapula and to the spine of the scapula. There's actually, I've already passed this uh, series of mattress sutures and passing these sutures. This is a patient, same patient uh, that I saw the original video. This is four months afterwards. There's her incision. Her pain is now down to two. It was at, at eight. And once again, you see good control of the muscle activity, still got a little bit of weakness, but good control, none of the scapular dyskinesis, and she's making very good progress. So in, in summary, the scapula plays multiple roles in normal function. It creates a lot of problems when it's not working well. In about two thirds to three fourths of all patients with scapula with shoulder pain, scapula will be shown to have a problem. Uh, it's up to you to demonstrate that because like I say, it's there, there very commonly. As part of the treatment, whether it's surgical or non-surgical, scapular uh, rehabilitation is very important. And your job is to demonstrate this to the patient as part of the original evaluation and then treat this. So uh, that's a very quick overview of this. I would certainly like to uh, 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 discuss this in any way that we can. Like I say, however you want to go over this and, and uh, go over this in more detail, please uh, give me your questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Like, thank you, Dr. Ben. This was just uh, too good for us. Just a small question from my side. Can you answer your screen? Yeah. Yeah, we have answered. Yeah, yeah. Small question. How you, how you diagnose that your peak minor is uh, a bit like tight? And it's your lower trap, lower trap is tight because this is very difficult for us to understand. Yes. All right, so the pectoralis minor is a very large muscle. It actually runs from the coracoid. You can actually feel it right on the right on the coracoid process. It runs straight down to the fourth rib and then diagonally to the sixth rib. But you can actually palpate right at the coracoid, have them stand in the normal position, palpate, and you'll palpate tightness. You'll feel pain. Then you have them do an attempted scapular retraction, and you will feel that muscle get tight and up. Oh, that hurts. So this is clinical exam for palpation for this tightness. Now, the other way you can do them, you can have them uh, uh, stand against the wall, stand up against the wall, measure the distance between the wall and the anterior chromium on both sides. Pectoralis minor tightness is clinically observed if there's a difference of 1.5 centimeters between the non-injured side and the injured side when you measure the acromion from the wall. This is very good clinical, but mainly just poke on it. It hurts. It'll really hurt. The latissimus is another muscle. You palpate all along the lateral border of the scapula as they bring their arm in this position. They'll be very tight. Then you ask them to fully extend their arm all the way over it and you just feel the tightness. Once again, this muscle gets adaptively tight. You tend to protract the scapula and you don't notice it until you have to retract the scapula. Well, when you do work, that's where you need to go. This muscle gets tight, it stays tight. Once this muscle gets tight, the serratus anterior gets weak, and that's a bad combination. You cannot rehabilitate the scapula well with the scapular retraction exercises if you have tightness of the pectoralis. The upper trapezius is the third muscle, but the pectoralis minor, the latissimus dorsi, the upper trapezius seem to get weak, get, get tight very commonly together. And once again, it's a thing of palpation. It hurts right in the middle of the trapezius. Have them, you know, it'll be tight. Have them depress the scapula and you'll feel even more tightness in through there. So that's no, when you do that, what's called low row maneuver that I showed you, when you do that well, it relaxes because it activates the, the lower trap. It, it deactivates the upper trap and you'll notice that if they do that low row maneuver, that this all of a sudden becomes uh, not tight anymore. So once again, it shows it's a it's an inhibition thing. And you once again, you can demonstrate this to the patient. You stand behind them and you're doing something to their shoulder blade and all of a sudden they don't hurt. And so, or they hurt, <laughs> you make them hurt, but then you do something to make them not hurt. And then they understand why, why this is important for them 
to participate in why they need to do the therapy or why they need to do this these exercises. Can you use this? Okay, Sreyas, go ahead. Sreyas, please. No, I, I was having a question. I mean, okay, as okay, a part of like therapy, this. as a part of therapy, one maneuver you said is a low row maneuver, which is actually going to bring the uh, activate the lower trapezius and it release. What are the other maneuvers or rehab uh, principles which you follow to to make their scapular uh, position well? Okay, there, there are three things. There's a very interesting thing called loss of voluntary control. For some reason, in, in all shoulder patients, uh, after about six to eight weeks, maybe three months or so of pain of the shoulder, then the, the, the muscles don't work very well. And if you do exercises, they still don't work well. So you have to identify that. And the way you do that, if you actually have them put their arm up against the wall. You actually have their, uh, have them put their arm on the wall, have them, ask them to retract the scapula and take a step off the wall so that you have them on the wall so that gravity is eliminated. You have it kind of here so that it's not a lot of load out here. Then you have them, can they do this? First of all, you have to do it on the non-symptomatic side. You know, yeah, I can, I can lock my shoulder, but you all do this stuff. Can you put your shoulder blade in the retracted position right here? Just do that. You say, yeah, I can do that. Now, on the other side, ask them to do the same thing. And they'll, I can't, I can't do it. I can't feel it. And because they don't have the same neural control over that muscle, that's the first thing you have to do is you have to get that good. You can't say, here, do this exercise because it won't work. So our, our rehabilitation progression starts with identification of the tight muscles and the weak muscles. Tight muscles, pectoralis minor, lat, upper trap. Then you do the low row maneuver, which tells you about the weakness of the low trap and serratus. You do the one leg stability, which shows you the core weakness. And then you do this loss of voluntary control. Whatever you find. And if they can do this well, then boy, you're in good shape because you can start on this exercise right away. But our therapy program starts with hip and core strengthening without doing anything to the shoulder at all. We give that, we find that that takes sometimes as long as three or four weeks to really start working. In conjunction with that, we are doing the manual things we need to do for stretching of the tight muscles. Once we get that under control, that usually takes four to six weeks. Then we start using the uh, scapular attraction exercises. You keep, the you keep the arm close to your body. Out here is much harder for the muscles to work against. And then so you do exercises into here, not out here and out here. You have them do functional activities where they end up with what I call your elbow and your back pocket. Yeah. You got to make sure every exercise ends up to where they're in a position of scapular retraction. Not this way, but uh, elbow in your back pocket. So you get them back and down. And so, that, so that's why it takes a couple of months uh, to kind of get this under control. Now, it, with rotator cuff disease or these other problems, you may not ever get it right until you actually do the surgery. That, that guy with the AC joint problem or the clavicle fracture, you can't, you can't rehabilitate that until you fix the problem, fix the anatomy. But while you're going along, for example, in our labral uh, patients, we give them three weeks of therapy to see if they're going to work because by about four or five weeks, the ones that are going to do well will do well. And the ones that aren't, we know. All your rotator cuff patients, give them three or four weeks of this, and you'll be surprised how many patients with known chronic rotator cuff tears. The Dr. Jed Kuhn, who's a friend of mine, has done this study. Known, shown on MRI rotator cuff tears, will not need surgery because their symptoms are under control if you get the scapula in the right position. By three or four weeks of rehabilitation, you will know that group, and therefore you will not have to do the surgery on that group. So the basic principles are identify what's wrong. All your tightness, all your weakness, whether you have control. You've got to look 50% of the time, you're not going to do the right job if you don't even look at the core. So do that first, hip and core, muscle flexibility. Then you can start on the exercise. And we don't go with our scapular patients in this. We don't go overhead for at least two to three months until they get control here. Then you have to work through here. Now, eventually you have to get muscle fun function up here. That's where, that's where you, that's where you work. That's where you play cricket. That's where you, you know, do all kinds of play tennis. So you have to have that under control at some point in time, but that's farther down the road. But are, are, is there any classification which is required? Uh, I mean, there are a couple of classifications regarding six capilla. I mean, so do we really need to follow something? Yes. Uh, very good point. Um, 
there's there's uh yes you know the, the original classification that we came up with many years ago was this type one type two yes, type three one, one, and it turns one, two, out indeed yeah and, also, yeah and and that's and that's true but it turns out that very rarely do you ever just have one uh of those types <laughs> usually so therefore we go to what's called the yes no so if you see it based on this you know if you do this right here then yes no that turns out to be about 0.84 uh reliable so minutes so my classification now is just yes no if you see it then that means the scapula is bad and then you need to do something about it now we're coming up we're doing some work with a actually some some uh skin markers uh that that are going to be able to do this a little bit better once we get all the reliability out of that but right now clinically observable yes no if it's there then you've got a pretty good chance you've got an 84 percent chance of being correct then you have to once you see it figure out why why you why you're seeing it which one of these causative factors are the real problem but being your classification by like one two and three like one is like for the cough and two is for the your internal bank is this thing and three is like your for your arthritis do you still follow that or do you just go with the now the because your classification uh, system is very easy to yeah. understand and remember <laughs> well it would be nice if it is quite that simple but unfortunately we found it's not since this alteration of motion is a reaction to something else it's not causing very i don't think that scapodiskinesis causes any problem i think it's the result of this so it's it the in general what you described is true that most of the time you'll have those associations with those particular findings. Uh, and it's not a bad way to look at it, but right now um, I'm afraid it would be nice if it's that simple, but unfortunately, as usual, as you get experience with this, you find it's not quite as simple with that. When usually in our practice, we usually do the uh, lawnmower sort of exercise and also the, uh, your bank robbery, this sort of position. Do you, because, because these are very easy to, for the patient to just, once they see that, you will understand. Do you still for, advise those because gradually from your, like your, like your hip, uh, the waist position and also then we go to the bank robbery position and the lawnmower. These are very, very easy to understand. Do you still go ahead? Or when you yes. go ahead, what is the classic indication of going to, for those three things? No, those are those are great exercises. They work all the time. You just have to have make sure that you're okay. For example, lawnmower requires that you have some good hip and core stability. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Before we ever do the hip, before we do the lawnmower, we want to do the hip and core. So, and before you can go up here with the robbery, you have to have once again all these things under control. They they are exercises that are down the road once you get the basics under control. But those to actually do the scapular muscle training, those are fantastic exercises and we still use those. But to get to that point, uh, we found that you have to, once again, get, you can't do the lawnmower if you're tight right here cause you'll, you'll lean down. And so you gotta get the pectoralis loosened up. And if you do the lawnmower where you go up uh, here, you gotta have your lap. And if you do the lawnmower in, in retraction and, and hip extension, you gotta have your, your core stability. So you have to work on the, the, the basics, but those, those still are the main stay of our uh, exercises um, in terms of getting the dynamic control of the scapula when the patient is ready to do that. Ben, what are the routine investigations you give for this uh, six, six scapula? Just tell me, sorry, because we are all very basic learners. Just tell me what are the basic things you do for your like uh, nerve conduction study, when you do the MRI, what are the special extra views do that? Because we are all learners, because it is, it is a scope to listen to you. We are not going to leave you. <laughs> well, the, you're exactly right. Where, where does all this fit in? A lot of times the patient will come to me with already having an MRI, an MRI but that's not the way I do it. You know, yeah, yeah. I like to go ahead and, and, you know, make sure I know the history well and make sure I know the physical. You, the physical exam is, to me, the key point because you can find so much information about what's going on uh, and also what this patient expects out of this. So physical exam is, 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 is key. And I always get a regular x-ray because there are some problems. Uh, if I identify these problems and the patient understands the problems that we found on the exam, and there's not just, I mean, it's not like they have no extra rotation strength or they dislocate every time you move them, things like that, then I will certainly try a therapy pro, uh, protocol for the first three or four weeks and explain to them why. I say, look, this is why you need to do therapy. You can't stand on one leg. <laughs> I do this to your arm, you make you feel better. Uh, you have weakness out through here that even if I operate on you, it's still gonna be weak. Therefore, we need to get this a little bit better 
um, taking care of. I give them these the statistics. 50%, 40-50% of the labral injuries don't need surgery. Uh, as much as two-thirds of the patients with uh, rotator cuff tears do not need surgery. And I do I do maybe one subacromial decompression as an isolated operation a year. Impingements are almost always due to something else. So I, I, there's a lot of patient education as well. And they said, well, but my MRI said I had a rotator cuff tear. And I say, well, yeah, but that doesn't mean anything unless uh, your other symptoms uh, match that as well. So I try to spend a lot of time with that. But if they do not do well, then I think imaging is very helpful. And I am I would rather operate on something sooner rather than later if it needs to be done, whether it's a clavicle fracture, AC joint, labral injury, rotator cuff, you know, because of the downside uh, of waiting on this. So I'm relatively uh, aggressive, but they have to meet these criteria uh, for this. MRIs, I think, are very helpful. Uh, however, remember, MRIs are only static. They're not dynamic in any way. Your, your exam is your dynamic part to know does it hurt up through here. And uh, with our throwers, this is a classic example that you can have an MRI that looks pretty bad because their shoulder muscle is so good that they don't need to have the surgery. So that would be my main criteria is not what the MRI shows. And the MRI is a piece of information that is confirmatory, not diagnostic in, in, in my hands, in my thought process. Uh, ben, is there a role of taping of scapula while you are rehabilitating them? Yes, taping is a great way of doing a, a continuous scapular assistance tests or scapular tests. You know, now, is, is it work in every case? No, of course not. But it is proprioceptive. It's adjunctive. It helps to get the scapula in this right position. And it's pretty good uh, in patients who have the need to be protracted a lot, you know, people who work at their desk all the time or things like that. So it can be helpful in that situation. The problem, of course, is that it's difficult to put on, there's skin issues and things like that. But as a, as a helper, as a um, reminder, uh, as part of this, I think uh, this re-education, especially in these ones that have this loss of voluntary control, that tells them to kind of, hey, yeah, this is the position to put in there. So yes, I, we use it a lot. Ben, is there any role of any time like your nerve conduction study? Because sometimes people tell for the long thoracic nerve to recover, it is like two years. What's your yes. take on that? How long you can wait for the long thoracic nerve to recover? Uh, uh, it's a very, very a critical issue, very critical issue. Yes. That's why the, yes. I'm asking the boss. Yes, two things. First of all, to get a positive EMG, you need to make sure you have a really good emg -er because you can miss, you can, you know, this, these muscles are not easy to, um, to do. The classical example, of course, is the accessory nerve palsy where the, where the trapezius is atrophied. And so you stick that needle in there and all you get is rhomboid. <laughs> he said, oh, I got a normal exam. I mean, so you gotta be careful about that. Second thing is remember the long thoracic nerve is a long thoracic nerve for a reason. It's a very long nerve and it's subject to traction uh, in scapular dyskinesis. <laughs> dyskinesis. Yes. So unless they have the true serratus anterior palsy, as I mentioned, the fact that they have the medial border, the inferior, it has to be the inferior. Remember the serratus anterior inferior is medial border control. So if you see the entire medial border winging, you also have problems with low trap not working as well. So, so that's by itself is not a wing, not a serratus anterior problem. But if they have the inferior medial border and they cannot raise their arm above 90 degrees, that is serratus anterior palsy for sure. Anything less than that can be other things and including a long thoracic nerve traction because of the scapular dyskinesis. So and if they, if they have this serratus anterior problem, but they can still go over this way and I can, and they're way around in protraction, I will once again tape them, I will stabilize them in some way and watch that nerve because sometimes they will have a positive EMG. But you'll see sometimes that those EMGs will return to normal if you get rid of the traction. Now that takes a, takes a long time, six or eight weeks at least. I give them a, I give them a year uh, if they have a true mononeuropathy that's out before I talk about uh, muscle transfers, but because it takes a long time. And you can watch the clinical course, but that's a very difficult um, um, case. And, and it says, I have a lot of patients with, with scapular dyskinesis and we do, we, we, for a year, we did EMGs on every single one that came in. We had like 300 patients with, with uh, scapular dyskinesis. We did EMG on every single one of them or had them. And we had positive EMGs in 5%. 
mm-hmm. and true modern neuropathies in about three percent. So, so once again, that, that's a, re- a relatively rare reason for the overall picture of scapular dyskinesis. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. It's now. It's now. It has been crystal clear to me. Ben, uh, yeah. is is dyk- dyskinesia common also in multidirectional unstable patients? Yes, and uh, I don't mean to don't mean to pick on you, but the word that we need to use is dyskinesis, because uh-huh. dyskinesia is a specific neurologic problem that is it, it can can be seen. It's altered motion, you know, this tardive dyskinesia, and the dyskinesia okay. altered motion for a neurologic reason. But dyskinesis is the larger term, so okay. that I got a little bit of you know, anyway. Yes, now how yes in multidirectional instability, it's both a cause and effect. Um, it's probably not the only reason, but um, in any type of instability, any of this abnormal translation will create pain or weakness or whatever, and so you get pain-based inhibition. However, the other thing about multidirectional instability is when they look at the um, muscle activations and the, what's going on in this, you find that, once again, the multidirectional instability, the, the main clinical symptoms are in the mid-ranges of motion. They're not where the anteriors or the posteriors are it's in the mid-range that tells you that this is a dynamic issue and what will happen they've shown that the muscles that get tight by emg are pectoralis minor latissimus dorsi and upper trapezius the muscles that get weak are the infraspinatus and and uh i mean infraspinatus uh low trap and the serratus now what happens in this situation is that you raise your arm up in this position kind of coming up through here because of this activation wrong way, your scapula protracts, the inferior part of the glenoid tends to open up and the latissimus basically pulls the, the, the humeral head out. And so a lot of the, in the multi-direction, the true multi, and the ones that, you know, do the party trick, they, you know, and if you stabilize their scapula, you remove their party trick. <laughs> they can't dislocate them because now they got the scapula, the uh, the lats not firing, the upper traps not firing, the uh, serratus is working, and so the scapula is in this position. So you have control of this to make it work better. So in all the multi-directionals, uh, that, that's the reason sometimes why the, the surgical success rate is relatively low in these multidirectionals. You don't do that. You tighten up the capsule, you allow them to do this again, they're going to, their genetics are going to win every time. And so uh, you got to get that under control. And it's harder sometimes with those multidirectionals to get the muscle under control because there's, there's something about their tissue that's not good. And so it takes more strength, more uh, activation to keep those muscles in control. But you can, in a, in a significant number, uh, get the symptoms gone with, uh, with the multi in the multi-directionals. And certainly in the posterior instabilities, a lot of times you can do that. Anteriors, you know, that's an anatomic injury to a large extent. You know, they got the bank heart lesion. You can't get the scapula under control in a large number of cases until you fix that. So yeah, so those you got to fix. But the multi-directionals, you know, you, you have a good chance. Great. What, what, uh, we, what we get from your talk is is uh, that a lot of rehabilitation essentially requires uh, a bit of manipulative therapy as well. So home care program probably would not work in these patients. They would need some supervised program in form of uh, stretching of the muscles and a proper, uh, yeah. Yes, when you first start this, uh, first of all, they can't see the scapula. I mean, if you ask them to do this, and they can see, the, they can do these exercises real well. <laughs> They can't see anything back there. So they'll end up doing the best they can. And we have this loss of voluntary control. For example, a great serratus anterior exercise is this, this, you know, these rows. Well, what they'll do, they'll pull back, but they won't pull back like this. They'll pull like this. They're, they're, they're getting their arm back, <laughs> but they're not doing it the right way. So there is a training and, and it takes a while to kind of get this. So a sheet of exercises for a scapular dyskinesis only works after they know how to do this. And it takes, it takes some therapists, some pretty good, uh, you gotta really work with it. And you like you say, it's manip- manipulative, it's hands-on to get this loosened up, to position them in the right position, to have them understand that this is the position to work out of, and that you end up having to do the right mechanics. Just like any weight training, you gotta do it the right way. Yes, basically, basically keep, uh, being, because primarily we start with the low row. Is it correct? Low row is a fantastic exercise if it, once again, if you have the hip and core working well. 
Now, if you, once again, you're, you are giving the patient a task. I've got to take my arm and I got to push it back. Okay. Well, if it's, Hip and core are not strong, low traps not strong, then you'll use the triceps every single time. And you'll do this and you'll do one of these numbers right there. And they'll get it back, but they won't get it back the right way. So you have to watch very carefully. So actually, Ann Cools from Belgium has done some huge amount of work on this. And once again, the activation sequence for using the low trap or anything through here goes from the left leg to the left hip in a diagonal fashion. So make sure as I showed on that video, activate that hip and core, especially left side, as you're doing that exercise, make sure that your elbow gets into your back pocket. And that's a, that's a great exercise if everything's ready to do it, but you can do it wrong. And that's, and you'll see them, they'll do 50 of these. And do, <laughs> they wonder why it's not working because they're not doing it this way. Great, Ben. Um, I've just got a couple of questions, but before I ask you, uh, there's a question on the chat as to your decision to operate on a clavicular fracture. Does it depend on the presence or absence of scapular dyskinesia? Or do you consider them, operate? Uh, dyskinesis, yes. <laughs> well, that's a very major, very major consideration. And why is that? Because the clavicle, actually when it, these cla the common mid-shaft clavicle fractures, there are three possible problems that can happen to this distal fragment. The first, of course, is that it can be shortened so that from the, sternum to the acromion, the entire distance is shortened. We all see that, you know, this is overriding. You can see that. Oh, yeah. The second is that you can get an angulation, which is very common. But the third and the most critical is that you, that you can get anterior rotation of the distal fragment. And the reason for that is that all the muscles and all the forces that are going to act on the distal fragment go toward anterior rotation. You've got the pectoralis minor, You've got your uh, other the bicep. You've got the weight of the arm. You've got um, the scapula tendons. So everything tends to rotate this forward. That was the problem in that patient I showed. So what happens then is that you heal in that position. That that one cyclist probably would heal uh, is his fracture, but he would heal in that position I showed in that in that uh, other patient. So that. Uh, if you do not, and, and the scapodiskinesis is a very good indicator of all of failure of all three of those functions of the clavicle, but it's very, very uh, helpful in understanding this anterior rotation. And once again, if it heals, then you have to live with it. You can't raise your arm necessarily, not everybody, but, uh, and it looks like there's some studies that show that if you have mo more anterior, if you re anteriorly rotate in this mal union, more than 20 degrees. So, so 20 degrees of anterior rotation, your body can kind of adapt. If it's more than 20 degrees, and we've done some 3D imaging on some of these patients, and they can get as much as 40 to 45 degrees of anterior tilt, you know, then you really have limitation of function. Does that mean your, your arm's gonna fall off? No. Does it mean you can't work? That means you can do things down here, but anything you need over here, if you have that much of anterior rotation, you will never be able to get your arm in the position well. So as a surgical indication, uh, uh, the presence of scapodiskinesis is a fairly high, you know, with these other things, you know, the, the an angulation and the shortening and all that stuff. But um, uh, it's a very reliable, a very good method. Uh, because right now we know that surgical, you know, there's lots of studies show that surgical treatment of clavicle fractures is associated with better outcomes in, in groups than non-surgical treatment if, uh, uh, you know, in terms of outcomes, things like that. But the deal is, who do you operate on? And the patients I operate on is when the clavicle function is not working. And that's because this is anterior tilted. And therefore, that's what we need to fix. Same thing about AC joints. The only AC joint ones you need to operate on is when the shoulder isn't working well. And and the clavicle and the scapular positioning is a great indication that the that the shoulder mechanics are not optimum. Great. So along the same lines, it also means that you've got to regularly follow up your patient and check for scapular dyskinesis if it appears at a later date, which might exactly right. influence your change of decision. Yeah. Great. What I do for both clavicle fractures, acute clavicle fractures, acute AC separations, I tell them this, and I have them come back in three weeks. 
usually like I showed in three weeks, a lot of the soreness is gone. I mean, he didn't hurt there. The AC joint doesn't hurt after three weeks. Now you can see this. At that time, it's still, um, still acute enough that you can do the surgical procedures. AC joint surgery, I, we wrote this up in Journal Shoulder and Elbow in 2017, how we do our technique. It's a very good operation early on. It's a good operation later on too, if you need to. Uh, and clavicle fractures, everybody knows. You know, you'd much rather just take that little fracture callus down than try to break that bone and realign everything because 5% risk of nerve injuries, all kinds of stuff, non-unions. So I'd much rather operate on an acute clavicle fracture than a chronic uh, malunion or non-union. Also in relation to the question asked earlier that do they need a supervised uh, physiotherapy program, it's also important to emphasize that it is a prolonged program and it takes about six months. So uh, what, what is the state of compliance do you see in your group of patients? Uh, about two thirds will do what you want them to do. Now, after, after the first six weeks, they can basically do their, their own therapy. We, we have a, a, an established you know, telemedicine type situation with our therapy because we get people from all over the country and everything. So we will uh, we will watch them and we will set them up with specific guidelines and progressions we want them to see. Usually after about six or eight weeks, they will have enough either interest in this or have had benefit from this and know the exercise, know their body's doing well to progress pretty much on their own. Sometimes it's not. If we've had these patients with two or three years worth of problem, it may take a year for them to get better uh, before, and they need a little bit more therapy. Uh, uh, so, but most of the, usually by about three months, they can pretty much do this on their own. But I do tell them that it's six to eight months before it gets as good as it's going to get in these chronic ones. And the acute ones, usually they're back pretty good within the first six weeks or so. Great. And, and in these throws, the patients you see, and obviously, uh, you know, the cricketers, the bowlers in our country, uh, if they have a slap lesion, say a type two, would you be more having reviewed the current evidence about, you know, slap tear management? Would you be more inclined to treat them uh, non-operatively uh, and improve their core stability and, you know, take it on from proximal to distal rehab and rather than offer them surgery? What, what is your experience? Um, well, in general, I think a, a non-operative approach for this first four to six weeks is, is very reasonable. And if they have achieved some goals of scapular improvement, uh, rotator cuff strength, uh, and the symptoms relief, then I would go that direction. But if not, then I think there is a, 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 a much um, uh, beneficial way of treating these surgically. Now, for example, um, in the current, I think it's the current issue of the uh, journal of the Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, that yellow journal, the review journal. Uh, there's an article, there's a paper in there, the lead author is a guy named Sheehan, S-H-E-E-H-A-N, and Dr. Jim Bradley from Pittsburgh and myself are co-authors. And we look at, at the labral injuries and we make the case, and I think uh, it would be a very strong case in you cricket bowlers, that the, the slap twos are not the problem that the problem is that this, the, the clinical problem is that the tear goes, extends posteriorly mm -hmm. and becomes the slap eight, for example. Um, the reason I say that, and once again, I am, I am not an expert in cricket, okay? But I understand that this motion right here is where you go. You, the baseballers are here, okay? Yeah, that's one thing, but you're up here, All right? That, that really puts a huge amount of stress on getting the scapula in the right position. But the other thing it does, Huge amount of stress on the biceps. Is that correct? A lot of biceps stress. Well, it turns out that if you get a slap two and you continue putting stress on the biceps, that goes to a slap eight almost immediately or very quickly. The, the propagation tendency uh, with continued biceps tightness is very, very high. Now, in our throwers, we find that this biceps gets tight very easily because of the motions and, and, the, and the, this motion right here. Now you all get out there. So I guarantee you that this biceps is under a lot of tension. When it does that, it gets what's called fixotropy, which is a mechanical stiffness. And therefore it's gonna be tight anyway. Then you go up here and do this all the time and you get your, you get your traction injury. And there's a great article in the Journal of Orthopedic Research from 2015 that shows that the increased biceps tension in, a, in this upper, this slap two, whatever you want to call it, 
all the tension goes right on the posterior attachment and it'll extend straight down the biceps uh, down, down to the posterior labrum. And so I don't fix slap twos. I don't think that's a problem. I think, especially in bowlers, if you fix slap two, then you can't get overhead because you tighten the biceps too much. I'm pretty sure. Therefore, what you do is you fix the, 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 the problem, which is the slap eight. And there's where you get your instability. That's where you get your pain. Look at, I don't know, once again, I, I've never operated on a bowler, okay? But, yeah. but I, I'm, I'm betting that you're probably going to see some of those posterior injuries and that that's where the money is. That's where, because now you have stabilized the biceps in a way. Now, as you got to get that biceps loosened up. It is just major. You got to get the biceps loosened up. You get the biceps loosened and you stabilize that from about 10 o'clock down to about 7 o'clock. Then their biceps going to work. Then you have your dynamic glenohumeral stability. And if you get the scapula where the chromium is not in the way, then I would imagine that would be the most efficacious way of looking at it. Once again, it's strictly based on, on principles and, and what I know, the little I know about bowling. No, you're, you're right. absolutely right. right. Am I anywhere close to being right? I think we, we, would, we would go back and start revisiting our bowlers and see probably more closely towards the posterior labrum. Yes, I yes. think I would find that lesion. We would because that, that peel back lesion tends to happen with time. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, exactly right. Okay. Yeah. Exactly right. That peel back, ben just, that peel back ben just, ben just keeps on going. Yeah. One, one, one small question, Ben, because, because of the tightness, post-operative tightness of the slab and the biceps. We are very apprehensive nowadays. When we started doing this lab repair, we used to put the front stitch and the back stitch. Yeah. Now we have now we have gone back to only the back stitch, not the front one, just so that the biceps is not that tight. And because sometimes the slap of post op patients are very very unhappy patients. Exactly so right. Do, exactly do, right. You, do, do you do only the posterior stitch and avoid yes. the anterior one? Yes. And the yes. question is, whenever you suspect your slap. Every time you do the MR arthrogram or you just do what? Because you posterior to your head, you cannot understand by your simple MR. Yes, very good points. Dr. Greg Bain from Australia has come up with a very great concept that I use all the time. The labrum is not the same, the entire circumferential uh, area of the glenoid. The upper from about 10.30 to about 1 o'clock um, to 1.30, uh, he, if you look at it, it's, it's, it's more mobile, it's rounded. He calls this the mobile organ of tension. And what, it, what the biceps does in that situation, it's dynamic tension band to help dynamically keep the ball into the socket. We know that that's the case. Now from about 10 o'clock all the way back around to two o'clock, he calls this the fixed organ of compression. And uh, I'm, I, I use this concept very commonly. And what it means is that when you lose the fixed organ of compression, then you get glenohumeral translation, and that's why you have symptoms, either in extra rotation or follow through. The, this, so therefore, you have to have this biceps mobile enough to do a tension band. Well, if you put an, if you put an anterior stitch, you automatically <laughs> limit that. The second thing is that if you put that stitch closer than 11 o'clock posteriorly, then you can still impede that. And you change that from being a mobile organ of tension into a fixed organ of compression, and you're just beating the heck out of that top. That's why you got all these problems with the humeral head is because it was just basically bouncing in through there. So you fix, So my criteria for determining whether I've done the right operation for a labral repair is that I have, first of all, fixed all the parts of the uh, labrum because a lot of times you'll have superior, posterior, or even anteriors, that you have created tension back in the posterior band. Remember that, the, that a lot of the fibers of the posterior labrum go into the posterior inferior glenohumeral ligament. So if you look at them carefully before, when you first start in your diagnostic evaluation, you'll find that there's no, no tension in that band. As you fix this, as you tighten, as you repair this, you develop tension back in that band. So that now you've got that whole posterior side doing what it's supposed to do, which is keep your arm from falling off. So my criteria are um, uh, fixing the, 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 the labral lesions, bringing that where it's supposed to be. My, I don't put an anchor above 1030, but I make sure that I have, first of all, that the peel back is negative, but that I have good rotation in the biceps coming forward and that the, the superior labrum can act as a tension band. They show that um, in this Journal of Orthopedic Research article I'm talking about, that if you only make a cut between uh, 11 and one, the tension in the labrum and the function of the biceps 
is no different than if you didn't cut. But as soon as you start going beyond 11 o'clock, then the increased load, increased tension, increased strain on the labrum propagates posteriorly. So that's why I think this, so my answer is 10, 30 is close I put, but I make sure I take, I make sure that they can do this, do this, so that I've, I've fixed that. So those are my criteria for determining whether I've done uh, uh, the right amount. Now the MRI, I do use MRI with contrast. I think it's very helpful, but if you really want to see the posterior labrum well, in this area between about eight o'clock and 10 o'clock, there's a view that instead of doing the classical um, axial cut, which is what you normally get with MRI, we here at the shoulder center have come up with a, what's called an oblique axial. And it, it, it gets a little bit better tangential view of that 10 o'clock position. And it shows what, cause in this posterior, sometimes it's not a complete tear, but it's a, it's a delamination, it's a fibrillation, it's a, it, it, it's a shear where these fibers uh, do not necessarily get torn, but they basically get stripped. And, uh, and it's just like in the knee where you have these hoop stresses, you lose the hoop, hoop stresses uh, uh, of the containment of the posterior labrum when you start seeing these fibrillations. And you can see this on MRI. And that's one of the things you look for in the arthroscopy, not necessarily completely torn, but these little strips that you can almost see it uh, in there. If you start looking for it, you'll see we, we just uh, completed an a, a abstract. We looked at the past two and a half years scopes in our practice. We have a, uh, in these labral injuries, we've got like 180 of them that we we're looking at. And 50% of them have no superior component at all. They have only posterior or anterior components. And uh, of the slap twos, the ones we actually fixed, 10%. 26% are the slap eights, and 22% are straight posteriors. These are in non-traumatics. So, so there's this posterior component that you need to look at, and you'll see the tear characteristics. A lot, a lot of them are tears, but uh, about 50% will have some component of this striation or this fibrillation or this loss of these hoop stresses. Great, excellent. Now, just going, going back to the clinical exam, uh, you know, you demonstrated that when we look for scapular dyskinesis on forward flexion, uh, uh, is it right to emphasize that we got to get the patient to do it a couple of times to unmask any muscle fatigue? Because at the first uh, maneuver, you might not get a positive test. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, forward flexion puts the most load on the muscles. Therefore, that's the best position. You could do it this way here, but you get most uh, load on the muscles here. And it's amazing that by five repetitions, a lot of them will start what I call kicking out. If you need a little bit of help, put about a two kilogram weight in their hand to do that as well. But if usually, like I say, if you do three to five, uh, that's what we use. Usually by the fifth time, uh, they'll show up. But if necessary, a couple of kilograms and that'll, low, uh, very lightweight, they'll show that as well. Yes, you, one time it may not show up uh, uh, as, you, as you found out. Okay, Ben. Because in our, in our center, the our the MRI, the the the, the those the, those who are doing the MRI thing, they are also suggesting that abar position for your slab. So, do you recommend that abar for the or or else you just whatever you told that recently we follow those. Oh, abar is a good position. It's great for anterior instabilities. For me, it's not a very good slap because basically when you do this, you're just you're just pinching everything up there in the superior aspect. So you can't tell. Sometimes you can see that internal impingement you get it right through here because, you can see because, the because of the barcard the peel of theory yeah, whatever yeah. Steve barcard is telling yeah, like so you so you can see that internal impingement but that by itself you know doesn't necessarily mean you have the injury but i think once again as a confirmatory that it's not it's a good test i really i really love this oblique axial and the axials with contrast because now you're seeing the post posterior labrums because once again i'm not too, too concerned about the superior as i am about the posterior see the posterior much, much better with the axial views. Okay, excellent. Great. Um, I think we've had a lot of questions and, you know, we've taken 40 minutes as good as your talk. Uh, and <laughs> yes, uh, really your talk was excellent and it was a clinical case scenario based, which is very important, uh, you know, from a surgeon's perspective. Uh, personally, you know, on behalf of the Indian Arthroscopy Society, really we are very grateful for you to take time off to participate. Uh, once again, a topic which is not uh, very well understood, but you really made it very simple. And certainly at some point in the future, whenever it happens, we look forward to your visit here and, you know, get you to teach a lot of other colleagues of yes. us and take it further. I would uh, love to do that. Much. Thank you. The link, if you want it, is 
uh, www.shouldercenterofky.com. All one word. Great. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, doctor. Uh, yeah, Ben, I've just got two more questions. Uh, apologies uh, if it takes a little more of your time. So the question is that uh, how often clavicle malunion mal leads to scapular dyskinesia? And in that scenario, would you uh, advise correction of the malunion only with physio? I believe you've kind of answered and you said that, you know, we need to uh, evaluate over time. And if there is persistent scapular dyskinesis, which is corrected by the test you demonstrated, then it's yeah. a case for surgery. So, yeah, I, well, in, in, a malunion, in a malunion, the incidence of scapular dyskinesis is very, very high because of the, the positioning. Not everybody, but a lot of times. Uh, there are cases... Um, a lot of times, the reason the patient comes to you with these malunions is because they have so much upper trapezius and periscapular pain because of the because of the muscles being worked so much because it's in a protracted position. And sometimes, I, matter of fact, the last malunion I, I did a couple of months ago, we tried exercises for six months, and he was so uncomfortable with the muscle part that he said, I understand about the malunions and the non-unions and all this stuff, but I can't live the way I am. He's 23 years old. So we fixed him. He woke up in the recovery room. He said, I don't have my upper trap spasm. So sometimes that's the reason for doing it. So you can try it all you want to, but if it doesn't work, then sometimes it does require realignment of the clavicle to get rid of these other problems. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so- One more question, uh, yeah. Yes, okay, yes. come on. Yes, last oh. question. Yeah, Ben. So, sometime uh, in scapular dyskinesia, you want uh, to uh, see the surrounding structure also. So, maintaining the neutral position of the spine, or uh, it is very important. So, what is your sequence of a cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine retain? Yes, so what happens with this? With, uh, obviously, if you have a scoliosis or something, or a kyphosis, that's going to put a lot more protraction. There's no doubt about that. So you, you want to, the cerv cervical issues, you know, they're the, the ones that I see, cervical issues are due to upper trap tightness and spasm. And so our job is to try to get the upper trap taken care of. Now the thoracic, we do a lot of thoracic mobilization because the muscles get, because the bones get tight and you end up, so, uh, but if you're, so for example, you do a low row test and you increase your kyphosis, uh, then you have to correct that. So uh, we will work on that as much as we can. Um, our, manip our manipulative therapists are very good at that. Um, I think that, that there's a role for that, uh, but the, once again, that's not usually the cause of the dyskinesis, unfortunately. Uh, it's probably more muscular, which is hopefully easier to take care of. But yeah, you've got to mobilize the thoracic. Now, lumbar spine issues, a lot of those, those lumbar disc issues or pain, that's that core stability, and yeah, you've got to work on the core stability and the hyperextension, all these things of the lumbar spine to make the scapula work right. So yes, all three of those areas have, in my mind, different interactions with the scapula. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. It was, it was just too good. And the thing is that you are too passionate about the subject. And you, whenever anybody you, you are telling about something about the scapula dyskinesis, we'll just listen for hours and hours together. So because we, we well, hopefully, I didn't, hopefully I didn't go overboard. Hopefully I got no, no, you all some information no, no, that there's um, no, no, be helpful. Because you see, actually the question part was much longer than your actual presentation because we have mm -hmm. got so many yes, queries as, as yes, my dear friend Shreyas told because uh, we have got you so we have to clear very, very many doubts. <laughs> Still it is left. So whenever this pandemic is over, we will definitely bet, meet for some I'd time. Come. In India for come. Your Thank you very much we'll, for we'll your we'll hospitality interest for your collegiality i just i just had a great time this morning so thank you all very much thank, thank you. you very much man thanks it a lot take care. You. take care bye bye, bye. Thank, thank you bye bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. take bye -bye. care uh, friends we have a, a webinar which is coming tomorrow and uh, it's on wrist arthroscopy uh, professor park cheng who who is actually from hong kong in prince wales hospital is going to speak on the wrist arthroscopy, where are we today? It's on 22nd of August, Saturday, that's tomorrow at 7 p.m. Do join at, uh, at IES YouTube channel uh, to hear it to Dr. Park Cheng Hu uh, from Hong Kong.